Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the blessing that we have already received today as we have worshipped you, as we have heard from your word, as we've had opportunity to fellowship with one another. Lord, you're so kind to us. You are so merciful. You are so gracious. You are so full of love and compassion. And as we come together once again to consider your word and to celebrate the great gift of the Lord's Supper as one of your ordinances in the church, as a means of grace to help us to continue to persevere in the faith, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would meet with us, that we would know your presence in our midst, that you would be glorified, that nothing untrue would be said here, but only that which is pleasing to you and according to your word. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you do this, that you be glorified in our midst, that your church would be strengthened and built up. And we pray you do all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'll join me, First Corinthians, or excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> We're just going to... Think about one verse, that's verse 2, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. And here, of course, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth who had many difficulties and problems within the church, and he's correcting them along the way. Uh, one issue, of course, being that they were dealing with many uh, false teachers and so here at the beginning of chapter 11 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul writes to them, saying, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. And as we come to the Lord's Supper today, I want to spend a few minutes stirring our heart's affections for the Lord Jesus, for who he is, and what he has done for us. And as the Apostle Paul writes to this church in Corinth, he expresses his jealousy for them because of the danger that they were in, and most certainly because of all that he had given of himself on their behalf. And he actually identifies the threat in verse 3. He writes, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And so the great desire of the Apostle Paul is that they maintain a pure and sincere devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a, a great danger for all of us. Lest we fix our minds, lest we fix our hearts continually on Christ, we will be led astray from a pure and sincere devotion to Christ. And this is one of the great blessings of the means of grace, the word of God, prayer, <coughs> fellowship of the saints, the Lord's Supper, baptism. These are the means that God has given us to help us to keep our hearts and our minds fixed upon Christ. And the great blessing of the Lord's day is that when we come together as God's people, we receive all of those means together. We're gathered together at the same time, in the same place, knowing that God has promised to use those means for our spiritual benefit. And so briefly, I'm helped here by Thomas Boston, I want to consider six important truths that relate to verse 2, and, and more specifically about our marriage to Christ as his bride, as the church as the bride of Christ, who is our bridegroom. So six important truths about our marriage to Christ. And the first one is this. Our marriage to Christ was in the heart of God from all eternity. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, as good Calvinists, I'm sure you have Ephesians 1 memorized, the Apostle Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved." 
And so these four verses in Ephesians, they are pregnant with wonderful truth. We could spend hours looking at everything, but I want to highlight here uh, a broader a theological truth that we call the covenant of redemption. Now, the covenant of redemption, it is an intra-Trinitarian covenant. In other words, the, all three members of the Trinity are involved. However, the primary focus of the covenant of redemption is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit giving full agreement to it. Now, throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus says things like, if God were your Father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Or John 5, 36, the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Or John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And there are many Old and New Testament texts that show this covenant being worked out. Jesus has a commandment to obey. He has a righteousness to fulfill. He has a baptism to suffer. And he has a work to finish. And so, very simply, the covenant of redemption is a covenant that was agreed upon amongst the members of the Trinity before the creation of the universe. And the covenantal agreement was such that God would redeem a segment of fallen humanity through the Son's work and for the Son's glory. Jesus agreed in the covenant to fulfill the exact requirements of the covenant that Adam himself failed to do. In return, having fulfilled those requirements, the Father has determined in this covenant to redeem humanity and to give humanity to the Son as a bride, a company of men and women whose purpose would be throughout all eternity to serve and praise and glorify the Son. We learn in Revelation 13 and 17 that the Father wrote the names of the redeemed in the book of life before the world began. And those names are written in that book as, as those who the Father is giving to the Son upon the completion of the work of redemption. It's a wedding picture. It's a marriage. The Father gives over the bride to the bridegroom. Before the world began, it was determined that even though you and I would live rebellious lives in opposition to God and with a hatred for Him as His enemies, Jesus would fulfill the law that we can only break. And then he would call us out of darkness into the light and make us his own. He would die the death we deserve to die. He would be raised from the dead to receive his just reward. And all of his works would be credited to us as if we had done it ourselves. So the first of these important truths of our marriage to Christ as his church is that it was at the heart of God before all, uh, in, in all eternity, before the universe began. Secondly, is the removal of our legal obligations in order that we can be married to the Son. Now, there's a problem that presents itself in the covenant of redemption, and that is the perfect justice of God, the law of God, and the truth of God. Justice says that there cannot be a match between a holy God and unholy, guilty men until justice is satisfied. The law says guilty sinners are mine, and I will not pay, I I will not uh, get rid of them, I will not part with them until death do us part. This is the law speaking about us. Apart from Christ, we have no option. We are married to the law as our standard. Truth says that God himself imposed his law on mankind, marrying man to this legal standard. And so only death could end that marriage. But the son would do what it took to receive his bride. And so he would do what was necessary to fulfill justice. He would do what was necessary to fulfill the law. He would do what was necessary to end man's marriage to the law. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the entirety of the law. 
Jesus died a sinner's death, satisfying the demands of justice. Jesus was raised from the dead, conquering sin and death and freeing all who believe in him from the legal requirements that we were all born into. Our old marriage ended when we put our faith in Christ. And so the law's death as an obligation for the believer gave way to a new marriage, a marriage with the one who has fulfilled every obligation on our behalf. And when that happened, the truth of God had nothing to object to because every requirement was met. Thirdly, the contract of marriage is written, signed, and sealed. In 2 Samuel 23, 5, David said, God has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? This is the written contract. Think about this, brethren. Christ, the everlasting Son of God, consented to be betrothed and married to poor sinners like us. To give himself as a humble, dutiful husband for we who did not honor, love, or worship him. And not only did he willingly enter into that covenant obligation to rescue us, but it came with a bride price that was to be paid to us. Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The covenant of redemption is the signing of the contract by the Father and the Son with the approval of the Spirit. And our God said, yes, I will do this. I will rescue these people. I will call them my own. And then it is sealed. This cup, said the bridegroom, is the new covenant in my blood. And today we celebrate the sealing of this betrothal to Christ. Now, some might hear this and say, but the bridegroom never got the bride's consent. How can he draw up a marriage, sign the certificate, seal it with his blood, and she hasn't even said yes. But while it may not be in the same manner that we are accustomed to seeing a man secure the affirmation of his wife, the Bible tells us nonetheless what Jesus said in John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And so as the bride, what do we bring to the table other than debt, wants, poverty, and misery? And yet he extends his hand to us and he says, you will be mine. The bride's consent comes by faith. And that faith is a gift from God. And when that faith is given, we will hear his voice and we will respond with a joyful yes and amen. Fourthly, Jesus pursues his bride. Now, Christ dwells in the house of our mother. And who is the mother of the Christian? It's the church. And through his public ordinances and by the words and works of his ambassadors, his, he courts his bride. In the preaching of the word, you have a good word that is given of Christ and his willingness to take unworthy sinners as his spouse, inviting sinners, exhorting sinners, pleading with sinners to give themselves over to him, to become a part of the bride of Christ. And then Christ enters into our hearts he communes with our souls, and when he unites with our souls, he convinces us that all of our other lovers will destroy us and leave us for dead. He convinces us that our marriage to the law will never be satisfying, it will never be fulfilling, and we will always have a spouse who only beats us down and tells us we aren't good enough, we aren't lovely, we aren't worthy. And while our old spouse, the law, speaks the truth, he cannot show grace, he cannot impart love, he cannot be merciful. You will never meet his demands. He will never be happy with you. You will never have sweet companionship with him. He does not have the capacity to give you what your heart so desperately longs for. But Jesus comes along and says, as you labor 
and are heavy laden. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus pursues his bride. Fifthly, with a new husband, the bride renounces all others. When the betrothed sees the truth of what Christ reveals, she gives herself over to the bridegroom. Her old husband has died, and in her new relationship, she receives the whole Christ and all of his benefits. The Apostle Paul teaches us, Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we served in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. The bridegroom says, if you do not renounce all that you have, you cannot be mine. And the bride responds, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart might fail but you are my strength and my heart and my portion forever. She's given over completely to her beloved, and she may never return to her former husband. The soul that is truly espoused to Christ is divorced from idols and lusts and lives by the grace that the bridegroom supplies. And sixthly and finally, the marriage is finally consummated in glory. Revelation 19, 6 through 9 says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so finally, the espoused bride is presented to her bridegroom, Christ, in the Father's house. The bride will be accompanied by glorious attendance when she is presented. The angels of heaven will be witness to this marriage, and what a joyful day that will be. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. And then the bride will see the bridegroom as he truly is, and he will make her beautiful. Brothers and sisters, we are the bride of Christ. God planned it from eternity past. Christ removed all of the legal obligations to pave the way so that he could be espoused to us. The contract was drafted by the Father, signed by the Son. The bride price was paid and it was sealed in the blood of Christ. Christ pursued us in the Father's house through his appointed means. We were called to renounce all others and and given the heart and the desire to do so and we await that great day when the marriage will be consummated in glory. What a blessed privilege we have, brothers and sisters. 
And now we come and we celebrate what Christ has done to win us, His bride, together in the Lord's Supper. What a blessing it is to be able to come and commune with the Lord Jesus Christ as He meets with us, as He communes with us and is present with us spiritually through these elements, through the celebration of this ordinance that He has provided to His church. So let's pray together and we will transition our time. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you once again for this great blessing, this great privilege that is ours to be the bride of Christ. Lord, we think about what you have done and how you have done it and how you planned it from eternity past, that it would be fully realized in eternity future. And we marvel. We marvel at your work. We marvel at your ways. But Lord, more than anything, we marvel that you would ever even think to count us to be among that bride. Lord, we all can honestly recognize that we are not worthy, that we are needy, desperate beggars, that we come but nothing but sin and guilt and shame and debt And yet, Lord, without embarrassment, without continuous rebuke, without saying, I can't have you, you have said instead, come to me, I will take you, you will be mine, and I will be yours. And Lord, we rejoice in that great reality. We thank you for Christ and all that he has done for us and most especially for his death upon the cross. And so we come now to this table, and we pray you bless these elements as we eat and drink together, that you would do a great work in us to bring us further along in our likeness to Christ, that we would be more faithful, more godly, more holy disciples of the Lord Jesus. We pray that you would do all of this to receive the glory that is due to you alone, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.